Iyasu V, also known as Lij Iyasu, was the designated but uncrowned emperor of Ethiopia. His baptismal name was Kaifal Yaakov. Because he was never crowned emperor, he is usually referred to as Lij Iyasu, Lij, meaning child, especially one born of royal blood, early life and ancestry. Lij Iyasu was born in Wolo during the reign of Menelik II of Ethiopia. His mother, Woizero Shoerega, was the eldest daughter of Menelik. Iyasu's father was Ras Mikhail, governor of Wolo and long-standing friend of Menelik. Mikhail had been born Muhammad Ali and was a Muslim until 1875, when he was obliged to convert to Christianity, becoming emperor. Background late in his life, Emperor Menelik was confronted with the problem of his succession. If he did not explicitly name an heir before he died, the nation he had built would likely dissolve into civil war and be devoured by European colonial powers. He had four possible heirs. His other three heirs were all in the female line. The first of these was his oldest grandson, Dejazmish Wasan Sigurd, son of his daughter Shoagarad Menelik by her first marriage to Wedado Gobina. The second heir of the female line was his younger grandson Lij Iyasu. Finally, the third heir of the female line was Menelik's elder daughter Woizero Zudachu, who was married to Raskugzavela, nephew of the Empress Taichu. Menelik refused to consider the Jasmish Tegulilat whom he deeply disliked. The Jasmish Wasan Sigurd was eliminated from consideration due to dwarfism. In March 1908, at any rate, Wasan Sigurd was in poor health and dying of tuberculosis. It was clear that the aristocracy would not respect a woman as their leader, so Woizero Zudachu was also not seriously considered at this time. On the 11th of June 1908, after experiencing a stroke while on pilgrimage to Debra Libanos, Menelik informed his ministers that Lij Iyasu would succeed him. However, due to Iyasu's youth, Menelik agreed to the suggestion that he appoint a regent during the minority of his heir apparent. Until Lij Iyasu came of age, the elder statesman Ras Tessaman Adu would be regent plenipotentiary. In May 1909, shortly before the emperor made this decision, Lij Iyasu was married to Woizero Roman workman Geisha the daughter of Rasman Geisha Johannes, granddaughter of Emperor Johannes IV and the niece of Empress Taichu. However, that marriage was annulled without having been consummated. Subsequently in April 1910, Iyasu married Sabla Wang Jilhelu, the daughter of Rashelu Tekel Hamanot of Gojam, regency not long after his decision that Lij Iyasu would succeed him, Emperor Menelik succumbed to further strokes. These eventually left him a mere shell of his once powerful self and incapacitated until his death in 1913. During his last years, in a bit to retain power, Empress Taitu intrigued against his choice, intending to substitute either her stepdaughter Luzi Dachu or her daughter's husband Ras Gugzavela for Lij Iyasu. In response to Taitu's intriguing, a number of nobles organized an ever closer alliance against her. On 28 October 1909, after a massive stroke, Menelik's choice of Lij Iyasu as his heir was made public with Ras Bichwo Edid Tessaman Adu as regent. The new regent found his authority undermined not only by the still living but paralyzed Emperor Menelik, but also by the Empress. For example, she insisted that questions from the foreign legations in Addis Ababa be directed to her, not to Tessima. Furthermore, Tessima himself suffered from an illness which left him appearing helpless and apathetic and would take his life within a year. It took a coup d'état TAT engineered by a group of aristocrats and the head of the imperial bodyguard to convince Ras Tessima and Hataji or just to decisively limit the influence of the empress. Despite these developments, the imperial government continued to falter. Administrators were unwilling to make decisions because Tessima himself might be overthrown, and foreign affairs likewise suffered. Despite this, 
Harold Marcus notes that the presence of Teslimas did Kirk ministerial dissensions and intrigues and was a reminder of the existence of central authority, with Tesema. Ayasu continued Menelik's program of modernization, including the establishment of the first police force in Addis Ababa. On 10 April 1911, Tesema Nadu died and, when the council met to appoint a successor as Enderes, Lij Ayasu demanded a role in the process. When asked whom he desired in the position, he is reported to have replied, myself, on the 11th of May, the seal of Iyasu replaced that of his grandfather, although not with the style of emperor. Marcus describes Lijasu's abilities as a ruler. From the very beginning of his de facto reign, Lijasu showed that he was not the stuff from which great monarchs were made. He was bright, but also impulsive, cruel, lascivious, prone to depressions and egocentricities, and politically inept. Despite his vision of an Ethiopia in which religion and ethnic affiliations made no difference in a man's political or private career, he had no clear comprehension of the power realities in the empire, nor of his own position as its ruler. In the first year, he was faced with several serious challenges to his rule. On 31 May, Rasabate attempted a coup d'acute TAT by seizing the arsenal and its modern weapons in the palace but was eventually convinced to make a public submission in return for being allowed to depart for his estates in the southern provinces. On 14 July, an attempt was made to poison a Yasu. That same year Menelik's soldiers sent a delegation demanding back pay and regular supplies, which made clear that the government was on the brink of financial insolvency. Intelligence reached Ayasu's father, Ras Mikhail, of another plot, and he arrived on 14 November in Addis Ababa with an army of 8,000 men. This was only the first of many efforts Ras Mikhail made to keep his son on the imperial throne. Mikhail established a powerful position behind the scenes. At this point, Lij Ayasu decided to leave the capital, ostensibly on a military expedition against the Afar. But he simply travelled through eastern Shewar and into Wallow, meeting with the common people. He had promised to return to Addis Ababa in May 1912, but instead visited Debra Libanos, then Addis Alam, before joining Dajaz Mishka Bada's expedition into southwest Ethiopia. Here Lij Ayasu took part in a series of slave raids, in which 40,000 people of both sexes were captured, half of whom died en route of smallpox, dysentery, hunger and fatigue. Marcus explains this constant journeying beyond the capital by his will, to prove that the government could not function without him and to force the ministers to authorize his immediate coronation, once he finally returned to the capital. He came into conflict with the commander of the imperial bodyguard, which was eventually settled by the mediation of Abuna Matawas. The conflict began when Ayasu expressed his wish to the ministers that the incapacitated emperor be removed from the imperial palace so that Ayasu himself could take up residence there. Trying to please the heir, the ministers asked for an audience with Empress Taitu and suggested that she take the emperor to Ankoba as a change of scene that might be beneficial for his health. Taiti had however been informed that Iyasu was intent on moving into the imperial palace, and defiantly refused to move either herself or her husband from the palace. Informed of this exchange, the commander of the imperial bodyguard swore that he would protect the emperor in his palace with his life. Angrily, Iyasu ordered the palace complex surrounded by his soldiers and only allowed in enough food for the emperor himself. With Ayasu's soldiers in a tense standoff with the Imperial Guard, the situation deteriorated to the point that gunfire was exchanged, and the bedridden Emperor had to be moved to the cellars as his bedroom windows were shattered in the battle. Hearing the guns, the Archbishop rushed to the scene and arranged for a ceasefire. Empress Taiti then emerged from the palace to publicly berate Iyasu as an ungrateful child who wanted to kill his grandfather. She angrily declared that neither she nor the Emperor would be going anywhere and return to her rooms. 
Iyasu was thwarted, but demanded vengeance against the commander of the Imperial Bodyguard. Although he had wanted him severely punished, he was convinced to accept a sentence of banishment from the capital. Iyasu indulged in a lavish celebration, which led the European diplomats to conclude that he was purposely neglecting urgent business and impeding the ministers from carrying out their duties. Lij Yasu left the capital after little more than a month, and during this time engaged in a raid upon the Afa, who had reportedly massacred 300 of the Karayu Oromo at the village of Sadamalka on the Awash River. Unable to find the responsible parties, he made a punitive raid upon the general population which provoked a general uprising of the Afa. On 8 April, after repeated messages from his father to return to the capital, he finally did arrive at the city and managed to accomplish nothing. On 8 May, Ayasu left to meet his father in Desi, Ayasu's reign. On the night of 12-13 December 1913, the Emperor Menelik II finally died. Ayasu was informed of his grandfather's death but insisted on continuing a mock battle game known as Gugs and did not allow any form of public mourning. The emperor's body was secretly locked away in a small room adjoining the seal Bekhidan Meherit church on the grounds of the imperial palace. No public announcement of the emperor's death was made, and no requiem or any type of mourning ritual was allowed. Empress Taitu was immediately expelled from the imperial palace and sent to the old palace on Mount Entito. Lijasu's aunt, Zudachu Menelik, was also removed from the palace and banished into internal exile at her estates at Fawla. By mid-January, the news had slipped through the official wall of silence. On 10 January 1914, the leading nobles of Ethiopia had gathered to discuss their response to his loss and the future of Ethiopia. Although no records of the 1914 meeting have come to the author's notice, Marcus admits. He states that, it is safe to conclude, that their arrival in Addis Ababa, indicated their fidelity to Menelik's heir, however, they opposed his immediate coronation. Although they did approve of his proposal to crown his father, Negus of the North, Lij Iyasu showed a pronounced lack of interest in the day-to-day, -day running of the government leaving most of the work for the ministers to deal with. However, the cabinet of ministers remained largely unchanged from the days of his grandfather, and by now the ministers wielded much power and influence. They were constantly subject to insults and disparagement by Elijah Yasu who referred to them as, My grandfather's fat and sheep. He constantly spoke of his intention of dismissing these shuins as he called them, and appointing new officials and creating a new aristocracy of his own choosing. His essentially reformist orientation clashed with the conservatism of his grandfather's old ministers. As Paul Henzer notes, Iyasu seems deliberately to have antagonized the shown establishment. He lacked the diplomatic skill and the refined sense of discretion that came naturally to Tafari. Iyasu's many capricious acts served only to further alienate the aristocracy. One was his betrothal of his royal-blooded cousin Woizero Sarkar Milish Seifu to his former driver, Tyler Hun. Another was the appointment of his Syrian friend and crony Idlibi to the position of Nagadras at the railway depot at Diadawa, thus controlling the vast tariff and customs that were collected there. All this, combined with his frequent absences from the capital, created the ideal environment for the ministers, led by Fitorari Hataji Georgis the Minister of War, to plot his downfall, Ayasu's fall. In February 1915, Ayasu travelled to Hara with Abdullahi Sadiq, who had become his constant companion, and went to the largest mosque of the city for a three-hour service. Throughout his stay in Hara he was friendly towards the Muslims an act which worried the priests of Ethiopia. When he remained in this Muslim community over Easter, they were scandalized. However, the foreign legations in Addis Ababa had been lobbying for him to join their sides in World War I. According to Marcus, many of the Ethiopian nobility and commoners were impressed by the early successes of the Central Powers. 
and both listened eagerly to German and Turkish propaganda concerning events. Both sides sought Ethiopian support. The Central Powers wanted the Ethiopians to drive the Italians out of Eritrea. Rumors circulated that, in return for Iyasu invading the Sudan with 50,000 soldiers, that he would be rewarded with the strategic port of Djibouti. At a minimum, the Allies sought to keep Ethiopia neutral. However, some reports indicate that Iyasu not only supported the Central Powers, he converted to Islam. In August 1915, Iyasu went to French Somaliland in disguise, and without informing either the French diplomats in Addis Ababa or even the colonial government. There he spent two days in mysterious meetings. Although Marcus states that what actually happened will not be known until information from the French archives becomes available. Fit Horary Tekel, Horary Tekel Mariam, a fervent reformer and a one-time friend of Iyasu, states in his recently published autobiography that the Djibouti trip was something of a vacation for L.I.J. Iyasu and that he spent much of his time consorting with Muslim notables in the city and consuming large amounts of QAT as well as completely depleting the funds of the Ethiopian mission in the French colony. Around the same time, the British reported that documents preaching jihad against the Europeans had been posted in the Hara marketplace. That August, the British reported that supplies were being sent to Jijiga to support the activities of Muhammad Abdullah Hassan and Sheikh Hassan Barsain, a devout Muslim pair who were at war with the British and Italians in Somalia. Then that September, the Italians revealed that one of their Somali agents had witnessed a Yasu declaring to an assemblage of Muslim leaders that he was a Muslim, and swore to his apostasy on a Quran. On 27 September 1916, while at the city of Hara, L.I.J. Yasu was deposed in favor of his aunt, Zudachu. The nobility under the leadership of Fitoreri Haptagi or Gistin Agda had assembled in the capital and charged L.I.J. Yasu with apostasy, alleging that he had converted to Islam and had thus forfeited the imperial crown. The Coptic Archbishop, after some hesitation, was convinced to release the nobility from its oath of loyalty to Iyasu, and he was declared deposed from the throne and excommunicated from the church. The Assembly of Nobles then named Sudachu Menelik as Empress of Ethiopia, and a jazz match to Fari Makonnen as was elevated to the title of Ras and made heir to the throne. Iyasu sent an army to attack Addis Ababa, which was met at Maso and turned back. His father initially hesitated, then marched south from Desi with 80,000 troops. On 27 October, Negus Mikhail was defeated at the Battle of Segale. According to Paul Henzer, Iyasu had reached Ankoba the morning of the battle with a few thousand loyal followers and after witnessing his father's defeat, fled towards the Eritrean border. On 8 November, Iyasu appeared in Desi where he vainly sought the support from the nobility of Tigray and then the Italians. On 10 December, Iyasu fled and took refuge with his followers on the abandoned amber of Magdala. At Magdala, he was surrounded and subjected to an uninspired siege. On 18 July 1917, Ayasu slipped through the siege lines and rallied the peasantry of Wallo to revolt. On 27 August, troops under Hataji just defeated the rebels and captured many of Ayasu's generals, including Rasai Mer. After this defeat, with a few hundred picked men, Ayasu fled to the desert of the Afar Depression, where he roamed for five years. On the 11th of January 1921, Iyasu was captured and taken into custody by Gugs Haraya Selassie. He was handed over to the custody of his cousin Raskasa Haile Dodge. Raskasa kept Iyasu in comfortable house arrest at his country home at Fish. Empress Zuda Chuai, who in spite of having been treated harshly by her nephew seems to have had considerable sympathy for Iyasu's fate is said to have tried to have him handed over to her personal custody in order that he be brought back to Christ and salvation under her guidance. 
In her view, the most serious part of his fate was his excommunication, and she deeply wanted to save her nephew from what she regarded as assured damnation. While her plea to have her nephew moved to the imperial palace in Addis Ababa was vehemently vetoed by both Fittoreri Hattagiorgis and by the crown, Prince. Rastafari McConnon, the Empress took care that Iyasu lived in luxury and was supplied with whatever he desired. Raskasa also adhered to this policy for as long as Iyasu was in his custody, so the terms of Iyasu's imprisonment were not particularly harsh.